Hello class, in this lesson we're going to learn about the patterns of interaction within an ecosystem where we have animals, let's say we have elephants, we got zebras, we got lions. At one point in time they have interacted within each other, whether they are feeding, whether they are simply socially interacting. We're going to identify the different patterns for the interaction that we have, how can we name them, how can we distinguish them, and what are the main characteristics that we have for these different interactions. Now, any interaction within an ecosystem can be broken down to two main parts. The first part is the feeding interaction. If we have organisms that eat each other, let's say we have a zebra that gets eaten by a lion, this interaction is referred to as a feeding interaction. Now, the second interaction that we have is the social interaction, where you have, let's say, you walk into the class and say hello to your friends. That's a social interaction. Within the ecosystem, we have the two main types of interactions, a feeding interaction and a social interaction. Within an ecosystem, if we have an animal chase, hunt down, and eat in another animal, this is called predation, where we have a predator, which is one responsible to chase and hunt, and we have a prey. The prey is the one that is being hunted. Let's say we have an example. Take a look at the leopard and the gazelle in the slide. The leopard is basically the predator, which is the one chasing, the one responsible for hunting down the gazelle. However, the gazelle is simply the prey. The prey which is going to be the one that's going to pass out within this interaction, the one that's going to be used as food within this interaction, within the whole predation interaction. So let's go through this example together. Which statement correctly explains the interaction between the spider and the insect? Select all that apply. The spider is a predator of the insect. The insect is prey for the spider. The spider immobilizes the insect. The insect protects itself from the spider. Let's, let's take a look at option A. The spider is a predator of the insect. Well, because the spider is the one responsible for hunting and killing the insect, so option A is a yes. The insect is the prey for the spider. The insect is the one dying in this relationship, so it is the prey. So B is also correct. Now the spider immobilizes the insect. What does the word immobilize mean? It means stops from moving. As we can take a look at the picture on the right hand side, we can see that the spider is wrapping the insect. So option C is also correct. So far we have A, B, and C. Now the insect protects itself from the spider. Initially it does, it tries to fight the spider. However, the spider in this case wins. So all of these interactions, all of these explanations, they are correct. A, B, C, and D. And within the interaction of a predator and prey relationship, there is something happening which is quite represented in the diagram in front of you. Now take a look at it. What do you think is basically taking place through the interaction between a predator and the prey. Now we have a wolf, or let's say a pack of wolves, and we have rabbits. Now the wolf is a predator for the rabbit, and the rabbit is the prey for the wolf. If I increase the numbers of wolves, the population of wolves, it means I have more wolves now in my ecosystem that are going to hunt my rabbits. So how do you think this is going to affect the population of the rabbits? Obviously, more predator, more wolves, less rabbits. Makes sense, right? Increase the number of wolves. They are hunting a lot now. Your rabbits will decrease. On the other hand, if you have too many rabbits in your ecosystem, it means your predators, they are not that much because they are not hunting those rabbits. They are not chasing those rabbits. Therefore, the rabbits, they are free to increase in size.
Now, within the ecosystem, if you take a look at the image that we have on the right side, we have something called an energy pyramid. Now, from the word energy, every single organism, let's say I have plants, I got rabbits from the previous example of the wolves and the rabbits. All of them, they have energy in them. If one organism eats the other, he's going to consume that organism and use that organism's energy to fuel their daily functioning. So let's say if I have the wolf eat the rabbit, the wolf is going to use the energy stored in that rabbit. However, have you noticed from the energy pyramid, as you go up, the energy decreases. Any idea why? Now, the lowest level of the pyramid is basically the producers. These are the ones that are getting energy from the sun and they create food using photosynthesis. What are they? They are the plants. So at the lowest level of the energy pyramid, we have the plants. Then we have the herbivores and we have the carnivores and we go up through the ladder. Now, the main question is, can you explain why the rabbit's population is higher than the wolves? What does that mean? Why the level of the population of the rabbits are at the arrow, as you can tell from the energy pyramid, and the wolves are at a higher level? Now, the answer is quite simple. Now, let's say we have energy stored inside the rabbits. Do you think once the wolves eat the rabbits, they are going to use 100% of that energy stored? Of course not. Now, the energy stored in the rabbits will decrease as the wolves consume them. Some of the energy will be lost as heat. Some of them will be lost as sound as the rabbits run around. Okay? So as you go higher throughout the levels within the pyramid, your energy decreases. The highest level of energy is at the base of the pyramid where you have the producers, the plants. The higher you go, the lower the energy gets till you get to the peak of the pyramid. Now, here's an example that we have for the predator and prey relationship that is shown over time. At the x-axis, we have time. At the y-axis, we have the population size. Now, the one in red is basically the average wolf population. And the one in blue is the average moose population. Moose basically could be considered as type of, let's say, let's consider it to be a deer. If you're not familiar with the word moose or what does it mean, let's assume it to be a deer. We have wolves and we got deers. Okay. And let's call them as moose in this case. So what happens is, if you can take a look at the diagram, you'll notice that at point A, my moose population is increasing. It means they are using resources in my ecosystem and their population is growing. What do you notice the effect that this has on point B, the wolf population? It's increasing as well, not at the same time, but as the population of the moose or the deers increase, after some time, the population of the wolves is picking up and it's increasing as well. So more resources, more population. Correct? However, if you notice that as point B passes and the wolf population increases to a maximum, the population of the moose is at the bottom. It gets to a minimum. Any idea why? Why when the population of the wolves reached a maximum, the population of the moose in this case reached a minimum? The answer is very simple, because the wolves now, there are too many of them, and they are hunting down the moose. So basically, they are reducing their numbers drastically. And over time, as the number of moose reduces, or the moose population becomes less, the wolf population will start to decrease as well. Why? Because now the wolves, they're running out of resources the population will start to go down after the population of the moose goes down. And the cycle begins again. Once it gets to a point where the wolf's population is to a minimum, then the moose population will get to a maximum. As you can see at point C, as the wolf population is dipping down, the moose population at point C is increasing.
Now, within an ecosystem, ecologists, scientists, they examine the relationship that two species have closely. Any long-term relationship or interaction between two species is studied by ecologists or scientists simply to understand the nature of this relationship. Now, symbiosis is basically the long-term relationship between two species. Symbiosis is a term used to define the long-term relationship between two species. Now, the relationship or the interaction that two species could have could be basically broken down to three different segments. Whether they are benefiting from each other, or one is harming the other, or basically there's no effect on one on the other. Now here are a couple examples that we can have to understand uh, the different types of relationships that two organisms or two species can have. Let's take a look at the dog and tick. A tick is a parasite basically that lives off a dog. In this relationship, the dog is being harmed. However, the tick benefits. If we take a look at the remora and the whale shark, the remora fish basically is a fish that hangs at the bottom of the shark and eats the leftovers from the food of the shark. Now, apparently the benefits, the remora benefits from this relationship. However, the whale shark really has no idea that the remora is actually attached to his body. So this way he's not even affected, not even noticing the presence of the remora fish. If we examine the bee and flower relationship, if we examine the bee and flower symbiotic relationship, the bee benefits from this relationship because it gets to make honey. And the flower benefits from this relationship because the bees can carry the pollen grains and help the flower reproduce. So these are different examples of the interaction between two species and how we can differentiate whether one is being harmed or the other one is being, as let's say, benefiting from the relationship, or basically if there is no, any, no, no effect whatsoever on the organism from the relationship. So we said symbiosis is basically the long-term relationship between the two different species. Whether one benefits from the other, one is harmed by the other, or basically one that isn't really affected by the other. However, we have better names, better terminology to actually describe these relationships. The first one is mutualism. It means basically both organisms within the symbiotic relationship, they are benefiting from each other. It's given by a plus sign for one organism and a plus sign for the other organism. The second relationship that we have is common cellism. Now, common cellism is basically another naming for not being affected, where we have one organism benefiting, given a plus sign, and the other organism is not affected through the relationship, given a zero or an O. The third relationship that we have is parasitism, where we have one organism feeding or living off and another organism organism without killing it so that organism is not killed in this relationship the parasite lives on that organism or in that organism and uses its resources now in this relationship we have one organism is benefiting and the, our, with the other organism is being harmed so the one that is benefiting is given a plus sign and the one that's being harmed is given a minus sign Now here's another representation of what we have just said. Now for common cellism, we have one species that is benefiting, which is dominated by a happy face. The second species has no idea what's going on basically, and uh, is not affected by the whole relationship. It's given by a plain regular face. Now parasitism, one species is happy, is using resources, while the other organism is not happy. It's being harmed in this relationship. 
finally mutualism. Both of them, they're happy. Species number one, species number two, they are both benefiting from each other. Now take a look at these examples. We have barnacles on a whale. Now barnacles are basically the small shells that are on a whale. Now in this relationship, it's a common cellism relationship because the barnacles, they are using resources from the whale. However, they are not harming the whale. They are having the leftover, let's say, food or bacteria on the skin of the whale and they are using it. However, the whale does not even notice their presence. So it's a common cellism relationship. Parasitism, on the other hand, let's say you have fleas on a dog. The fleas, they are sucking the blood from the dog and the dog has no idea that they're sucking the blood out of him. However, he's being harmed by the relationship. He's being affected negatively by this relationship. The fleas are using the resources of the dog and the dog is paying a price, right? The dog is becoming weaker, he's losing energy, and his resources are being used by an another organism. So one is happy, which is the fleas, and the other is unhappy, which is the dog. And this relationship is basically an example of parasitism. And finally, we have the mutualism, insects and flowers. Insects, they can get, let's say, the nectar, such as bees, from the flower and use it to make honey. Therefore, the bees are given a happy face. And the flowers, they can use the bees to help them transport pollen grains to produce. And that way, the flowers, they're happy as well. So that's why mutualism is basically mutual benefit. Both of them, they are given two happy faces, which means both of them, they are benefiting from each other. However, at this point, one of you might ask, so what is the difference between predation and parasitism? Now, we said the three symbiotic relationships that we have, mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. Correct. However, predation is a form of interaction between different organisms. Yet, what is the difference between parasitism and predation? Now, both of them, one organism benefits, is given a plus sign, and the other organism is not benefiting, is given a minus sign. However, the main difference lies in how the one which is not benefiting is being affected. In predation, you have a predator which kills a prey, right? Now, the prey is basically killed in this relationship. The minus sign organism is killed in this relationship. But in a parasitism relationship, the parasite lives off the organism, Right? It doesn't kill it. It uses that organism to provide it with resources. So that's the main difference. In predation, one organism kills the other. In parasitism, one organism harms the other by using its resources, by using its body to provide the resources that the parasite needs. So that's the main difference between predation and parasitism. Now, within an ecosystem, like what we have mentioned, different organisms interact with each other, correct? However, similar organisms, let's say, within a population, if we got lions, for example, and they have limited resources, such as a specified number of gazelles or zebras, they are going to compete for with each other. They are going to compete with each other to actually use that resource. So within an ecosystem, within the similar population, also within different populations, let's say you have tigers and lions, if they need a common resource, they might be competing with each other for this limited resource. So within an ecosystem, the competition for limited resources has costs and benefits. It could be helpful. At the same time, it does have some disadvantages as well. Organisms with similar needs, they tend to compete for resources. For example, all plants need sunlight to carry out photosynthesis, the production of food, glucose. Now, the tallest trees, let's say in a rainforest, creates a canopy, which is like an umbrella that blocks the sunlight. So basically, the tall trees get the sunlight. However, the plants below, 
they can get the sunlight. So this is a form of competition, even between plants. Taller trees compete for sunlight, and they win over the shorter trees, which do not compete for sunlight, or they are unable to compete for sunlight. So this is a form of competition within a population for a resource. So competition, by definition, is an interaction that occurs between organisms when they both seek the same resource in an ecosystem. In simple terms, if they need something, they are going to be competing for it. Now, this interaction increases and decreases depending on the availability of the resource. If you have an abundant resource, it's available in large quantities, your competition will become lower. However, if this resource is quite limited and it's rare or scarce, the competition will become higher. If you recall, we had an example about the moose population and the wolf's population when they are interacting with each other within an ecosystem. If we go back to that example, and let's say we add grizzly bears, which also feed on moose. They are introduced to the same ecosystem. What might change in the graph? We are going to identify what applies in this case in the following slide. Now, option A, the average moose population will be lower. Yes, because now there are more predators in the ecosystem. We have the wolves and the grizzly bears. The average wolf population will be higher. Well, the wolf population will not increase because now they're competing with the bears for the rabbits. So actually, the population of the wolves will decrease. Now, the wolf population will stop cycling up and down. No. Why? Because within an ecosystem, like what we have said, it's a cyclical interaction. If we increase the number of the wolves, my rabbits will go down, then my wolves will decrease, then my rabbits will go up. Similarly, it's an up and down relationship between the bears and the wolves because they are using the same resource. Once that resource goes down, the wolf population and the bear population will also go down. However, once, the once I have more resources, the population will go up again till they get to a point where they are using these resources, then following which their population will start to decrease after those resources have been used. Finally, the moose population will continue to cycle up and down, yes, as long as they're interacting with each other. We have a predator and prey relationship in this case, where one goes up, the other will go down. 